Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. What did you learn about the potential of a new lawyer on the president's team? So this is something the president's team has actually been struggling with for quite some time now. It feels like every week there's a report of a new kind of top-notch, top-shelf lawyer who they've reached out to, they're interested in bringing on board, um, and that lawyer says no. We reported that the latest lawyer they've reached out to is someone named Robert Bonner, and he's someone who sort of did some work in the Bush administration right after 9-11, and one of the advantages in theory that he has is retired from his law firm. So a lot of these lawyers, one of their problems is they sort of cite conflicts. But in talking to a legal expert and some people in the law community. These are not the traditional conflicts you think of where they have another client that might be at odds with this client or someone tangentially related to the case where they can't take it. The conflicts, to be clear, are that partners in their law firms don't want them going in and representing this president. Um, but again, they are, they've reached out to him. That doesn't mean he's coming on board. And there are a lot of challenges because there's, there's these sort of conflicts where law firms don't want to join this administration and represent this president or sort of partners are divided. And then there's the issue that a lot of top-notch lawyers, you know, white-collar lawyers say, I don't need this aggravation. I have a nice life. I make a lot of money. I have a good career. Uh, and I don't need to go work for a president who is going to undermine my legal strategy on Twitter, possibly undermine me on Twitter, and is known for paying late and sometimes not paying at all. So <laughs> there's a recognition can within you, the legal team. Can you put that into perspective for one moment? There are lawyers who don't want to represent the president because they know he has a history of stiffing people. Like, can we just take a moment and drink <laughs> that in for, for just a second? Imagine you're in law school thinking, one day I'm going to have the opportunity to work with the President of the United States and turn him down because I know he doesn't pay his bills. Amazing. All right, in your reporting, you say Trump was infuriated by the seizure of possibly sensitive correspondence, so upset that he had trouble concentrating on plans that were laid out for him that day by his national security team about potential options for targeted missile strikes on Syria. That's extraordinary to me, and it, it obviously has you think country first. He's not thinking Syria because he can't stop thinking about what could be in Michael Cohen's office that would embarrass and or incriminate him. Well, our understanding uh, is twofold. One, on this day when the raid happened, it, it consumed him. Um, and he was also, of course, getting briefed on Syria. This was right after the latest gas attack over the weekend. Um, and he was agitated and he was distracted. That said, I will say that White House aides said sort of for the rest of the week, this president does have an uncanny ability to compartmentalize, um, which is something he would need because he often operates in chaos. And our understanding is people in the White House, in the West Wing general, we're worried about exactly what you said. They sort of don't know what's been seized. They know Michael Cohen is involved in sort of shady dealings. They know he's recorded his conversations with associates, and they're deeply worried. For the president himself, the, the worry, and frankly, more the anger, is this idea that Mueller's team was not operating in good faith. That's why he's so upset. 
All right, Ashley, thank you so much. I just have to note that uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders told reporters on Air Force One when asked about Michael Cohen and his relationship with the president, I believe they've still got some ongoing things, but the president has a large number of attorneys, as you know. Wow, Captain Obvious. It just took a couple of days, and already they're about to call him the coffee boy. This is a guy who has said he's devoted his life and career to working for and defending the president. And now Sarah Huckabee Sanders is practically saying, Michael Cohen, who? Stunning. Ashley, congratulations. It is Thursday, the 19th of April of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Well, folks, um, I'm feeling a little down this morning. Uh, um, the uh, rescue dog that we took about a year and four months ago uh, passed away last night, and it was kind of a sad time. It, for me, it wasn't a, it wasn't an unexpected uh, development. He'd been ailing for a bit. Uh, when we took him, uh, you know, we we did recognize he was a little bit of an older dog, and uh, he had he had lived in an old folks home for years and years and years, a fairly tiny space. You know, like one of those deals where you know you get an apartment, maybe a you know a little patio area. So he he lived in a fairly small space for years. And uh, when that human passed away, he went to a relative and uh, apparently the guy in the uh, family didn't like the dog. And though it wasn't overtly stated, it, it seemed like maybe this guy had abused the dog or neglected it in some way. So uh, uh, we took it and took him and his name is Charlie. And uh, you took an immediate liking to mom. I, I guess his previous human and my mom were so similar that he really just couldn't tell the difference, apparently, because he followed her everywhere. Uh, would only do what, uh, you know, when he would take her lead, essentially. And and we could tell that, as I mentioned, that he might have been abused by a, a man because uh, he was a bit leery of me and most men. But uh, I like to think I want him over. Uh, I really liked him, you know. And he—he he wasn't actually my my favorite kind of dog. I've I've always preferred much larger dogs that I would, you know, I would always uh, say, you know, like a real dog rather than a dog as an accessory. Uh, Charlie was a little bit big for an accessory. You, you wouldn't be carrying him around in your purse. But he had a lot of poodle in him. And he was kind of roly poly and a uh, little bit, a uh, little bit blind. And uh, yesterday he had a great day. I was out uh, planting in the garden, got all the tomato plants in and a few other plant specimens. And he and Ginger, our, our other dog, was out in the sun. And he actually did all of his exercise things. Uh, one of the great exercises they like to do is that when other people in in town are walking their dogs nearby. The dogs want to run up and down the fence line, uh, barking at the dogs until the dogs come over and say hi, and then they're all good friends, and the barking stops. And But uh, Charlie was doing his thing, running up and down the fence, and uh, I thought that was a good sign. Uh, you know, he kind of waddled a little bit. For the last couple of weeks, uh, he would have a pretty good days, and then he'd get all worn out and just want to sleep on his bed and we have two one in the living room and one in my mom's room and for like the last week or so he'd been taking to not sleeping in her room he'd come out into the living room and sleep there and then at some point in the morning make his way back to her room and as i mentioned yesterday they had a great day both sat in the sun and ran around the yard a bit and uh but he came in last night, and he laid down and pretty much stayed there, and I checked on him a few times at night. Then my mom woke me up about 3.15 here on the Pacific Coast, and he was uh, kind of splayed out on our floor. He looked like he tried to make his way from his bed in the living room to, I guess, go out to the family room, maybe to go to the back door or to go to the bathroom, possibly, is what it looked like. So I picked him up, and he just kind of 
sat in my arms for a bit, and I laid him down on his bed and pet him for a while. And then he, he gave us a little croaky cough, and that was it. And it was sad. Okay. Let me get my uh, wits about me for a second here, and uh, we'll look at what we are going to attend to today. the top that was stephanie rule explaining why trump can't find a lawyer because well he is the worst client in the world and uh, we've known that for quite a while anybody who needs uh anybody who's whose own personal lawyers feel that they need to have three or four other lawyers in the room when they talk to him because the guy lies so much you know he's not going to be the best client you know what i mean Okay, on the rest of the menu, uh, in the Bistro Cafe part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, voter suppression czar Chris Kobach just got hit with a double whammy in federal court when he was found to be in contempt and also ordered to pay the ACLU's legal fees for continuing having, for continuing to uh, have to sue the guy for, you know, being a, a scafflaw. Cambridge Analytica whistleblower Brittany Kaiser warns of a much larger breach than what has been previously admitted. Yeah, they said 87 million, and I said, oh, first they said 50. Now they're saying 87. What is it? 150? 200 million, maybe? More? We'll see. And Democratic women are winning the fundraising race against incumbent Republican congressmen they are running against. Wow. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table, where the 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati ruled that Ohio cannot block Planned Parenthood funds. Okay, it's the law. And Ted Cruz is in total denial about how close he is to losing his Senate seat. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. go to the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you'll notice to the right of the page the chat room link, and uh, Kelly Lincoln, our roaring girl, monitors that quite frequently throughout the day, and diligently, too. It go, should go unsaid, but I'm saying it anyway. And uh, that's a good way to uh, contact us and uh, prices of any concerns, requests, or whatever. You could also follow us at... Uh, on Twitter, at Netroots Radio. Netroots Radio is also on Facebook, if you want to go there. And, I don't know, some people still do. Follow me on Twitter, at Justice Putnam. And also, uh, I do put up show notes and links on a diary on Daily Kos. And I can be found on Daily Kos as Justice Putnam. Okay. Uh, oh, I... Should mention also a podcast of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy uh, can be had by way of Spreaker, uh, Stitcher, TuneIn, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Music is provided uh, by Frances Livings, and uh, do follow her. Or I'm sorry, you can you could follow her on uh, Twitter. She is on Twitter at Frances Livings, and. Uh, uh, she also have shows all over Southern California and uh, 
check it out. Okay, I'm a I'm a little uh, as you can tell uh, discombobulated, and uh, I'll try to muddle through this. So, okay, all right. Uh, voter suppression czar Chris Kobach. This uh this is out of Share Blue Media by Allison R. Parker. Well, uh, Trump's uh, voter suppression czar, Chris Kobach, got hit with a double whammy in federal court. That's right. Okay, found in contempt of court and has to pay the ACLU's legal fees. You know. So I, I kind of wonder which one they think is worse. Probably paying the legal fees. That's the one, the, the contempt, uh, you can just ignore that. What are they going to do? Send a marshal to take you in? Well, Kobach has worked for years to push burdensome ID requirements on voters. His scheme has led to more than 36,000 Kansans being shunted from the voter rolls, often without realizing it until they went to vote. The Kansas law implemented far stricter requirements for proof of citizenship than most states require, and voters were often not told that they were missing required documentation at the time of registering. They would show up at the polls only only to be told they were not on the rolls and could only vote with a provisional ballot. And, of course, those ballots just get thrown away. We know that. Or, well, essentially they've been thrown away. You know, they're not going to be counted. Let's be clear. Robinson, uh, the uh, the judge here, has already reprimanded Kobach for a number of procedural missteps in the landmark voter rights case. In March, she slammed slammed him for failing to properly comply with the injunction and to ensure that people knew they were eligible to vote. Kobach had assured her that the affected voters would receive the usual postcard letting them know where and when to cast their ballots. But apparently... All he did was have his office give oral instructions to county clerks to send the postcards. He claimed he couldn't force them to do it. Robinson was not having it. She handed down the contempt finding, citing Kobach's history of noncompliance and disrespect for the court's decisions. But doesn't she know that there's a new sheriff in town now? And he makes the laws because he believes in law and order. It's his laws and his order. And because the ACLU has been forced by his inaction to file motion after motion, Robinson also ordered Kobach to pay the group's attorney fees. Kobach's behavior and his total disregard for the rule of law are atrocious. But they also make it clear why Trump wanted him on the so-called Election Integrity Commission with Mike Pence. Both Kobach and Trump continue to chase the fever dream of rampant voter fraud. Kobach's interstate cross-check cross system erroneously purged millions from voter rolls in multiple states, and Trump, of course, still clings to his fantasy that millions and millions of people voted illegally in 2016. Neither man let the fact that Trump was forced to dissolve the commission because uh, states refused to go along with this nonsense. And you're not going to sway them from those beliefs that they hold because they're true believers, aren't they? Indeed, Kobach likely won't give up his voter suppression crusade even after the contempt finding and having to cut a check to the ACLU. But his efforts will continue to be beaten down by judges who see through his charade. Next offering here uh, at the uh, Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, 
is by Jason Murdoch out of Newsweek. Cambridge Analytica, the London-based political analysis firm that worked on the presidential campaign of Donald Trump, used multiple apps to harvest Facebook data, and the true scope of the abuse is likely much greater than 87 million accounts, a former, tur- a former staffer turned whistleblower has claimed. Brittany Kaiser, who worked full-time for the SCL Group, the parent company of Cambridge Analytica, as Director of Business Development between February of 2015 and January of this year, told a UK government committee yesterday, I'm sorry, told him on Tuesday, the firm had used Facebook data it previously claimed to have deleted. Facebook has faced an unprecedented backlash after user data was allegedly abused by a researcher called Alexander Kogan. Kogan has been accused of using a personality test app to obtain data linked to millions of accounts. Jeez, why not just do tic-tac-toe or solitaire? Play this game of solitaire. Ooh, wait a second. Maybe they were already doing that. Never know. Kaiser, who has released a number of new documents into the public domain alleging to show how the company worked on proposals for the UK Brexit campaign, wrote in a testimony submitted to the government's inquiry into fake news, I am aware, she said, in a general sense of a wide range of surveys which were done by Cambridge Analytica or its partners, usually with a Facebook login, for example, the Sex Compass Quiz. I don't know the specifics of these surveys or how the data was acquired or processed, but I believe it is almost certain that the number of Facebook users whose data was compromised through routes similar to that used by Kogan is much greater than 87 million, and that both Cambridge Analytica and other unconnected companies and campaigns were involved in these activities. And campaigns, not just Brexit, maybe not just Donald Trump, maybe the whole of the GOP. Interested parties would like to know... Facebook's founder and CEO Mark Zuckerberg has said Kogan broke the website's policies and stressed a full lot it is currently taking place to find out, find out if other apps were using similar tactics. Come on, Zuckerberg. Are you kidding me? Ugh. They're doing it themselves, too, by the way. Come on. They wrote the programs or almost did. According to Kaiser, a U.S. citizen who, alongside former Cambridge Analytica staffer Christopher Wiley, is now considered a whistleblower, her former employer used the Facebook data during sales pitches to potential clients. She alleged it had links to the London Bureau, a far-right news website Breitbart, and significant time during the hearing was dedicated to its suspected work with Leave.eu a campaign pushing for Britain to exit the European Union. In a series of updates via Twitter, Cambridge Analytica denied links to leave.eu. We weren't in that. We were in another one, a much more virulent right-wing one, probably. Okay. Well, who is Brittany Kaiser? Well, she was born in Houston, Texas, grew up in Chicago. She was part of Barack Obama's media team during the presidential campaign in 2007 and has also worked for Amnesty International as a lobbyist appealing for an end to crimes against humanity. During her time at Cambridge Analytica, she worked on sales proposals and liaised with clients. She worked under senior management, including CEO Alexander Nix, who this week declined to appear before the same fake news inquiry because, uh, you know, they might just clap the cuffs on him right then and there. Kaiser claimed that the office culture was like the Wild West and alleged that citizens' data was being scraped, resold, and modeled willy-nilly. Privacy has become a myth, 
and tracking people's behavior has become an essential part of using social media and the internet itself. Tools that were meant to free our minds and make us more connected with faster access to information than ever before, she wrote in her testimony, instead of connecting us. These tools have divided us. It's time to expose their abuses so we can have an honest conversation about how we build a better way forward. I don't know. Maybe open source without all the commerce. Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays, is Out of Share Blue Media by Carolyn Orr. Uh, now, it looks like women are raising way more cash than uh, the GOP congressmen they plan to unseat in at least 20 races. Democratic women are winning the fundraising race. The 20 midterm elections are already turning out to be a historic race for women, a record-breaking 309 women are running for U.S. House seats as of the beginning of April. And, and according to the latest fundraising figures, women are not just stepping into the ring. They're trouncing the incumbent Republican congressmen they're running against when it comes to raising money. More than 40 House Democratic candidates outraised Republican incumbents in the first quarter of 2018. Half of those 40 Democrats are women. Well, I expect the uh, anonymous billionaires to be stepping up their game real soon. Don't you? More than, let's see, oh, for, from deep red districts to Democratic strongholds and everywhere in between, women are outpacing Republican congressmen in fundraising, sometimes by two-to-one margins. Notably, this trend holds true in some of the most Crucial toss-up races in Iowa, Minnesota, and California. Well, that's really nice. Democratic Katie Hill has raised over $70,000 more than her Republican opponent, opponent, Representative Steve Knight, in California's 25th Congressional District, for instance. Minnesota's uh, second, Angie Craig, has raised... $531,316 $531,316 compared to a measly $285,669 for GOP opponent uh, Representative Jason Lewis. Well, very nice. In deep red Democratic candidate, in, I'm sorry, in deep red Texas, Democratic candidate M.G. Hager has raised nearly $90,000 more than John Carter, the incumbent Republican. Nice. Okay. Uh, And you can thank women for a lot of this momentum fueled by massive anti-Trump backlash and a growing number of sexual misconduct scandals surrounding male politicians. Women are running for office and rebuking the Republican Party in unprecedented numbers. And yet another sign of trouble for Republicans, the older white voters who helped elect Trump in 2016 are now trending toward Democrats in such numbers that their ballots could tip the scales in tight congressional races from New Jersey to California, according to a recent Reuters polling update. And as Republican men bow out of politics, progressive women are ready to take their place as it should be. All right, let's get to our break and we'll come back, go through weather from around the world and then we'll finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy and we will be right back. You are listening to 
www.networksradio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. So the Internet is really a network of networks that underlies critically so many things in our lives. But really, 50 years ago, it was an experiment that escaped from the lab. And it wasn't really designed to be the global communications infrastructure it is today. Jennifer Rexford, a computer scientist at Princeton University specializing in computer networks. She spoke to Scientific American Editor-in-Chief Marriott DeCristina at the recent World Economic Forum in Davos. So it really planted the seeds of tremendous innovation around the periphery of the Internet and the devices we connect to it and the applications we run over it. But ironically, it didn't plant the seeds of its own innovation. And we suffer from that every day, from the fact that we have denial of service attacks, taking down websites, we have performance problems, Netflix streams grinding to a halt, and so on. In my work on self-driving networks, we're bringing together two really exciting technologies, machine learning that's transforming everything by taking raw data into true situational awareness. And the second is programmable network switches that bring the same idea of enabling and lowering the barrier to innovation that we have at the outside of the Internet to its basic underpinnings so that we can learn how to sense and actuate better over time so that the network can learn to detect performance problems and route around them, to detect denial of service attacks and block them before they do significant harm. So the marriage of these two technologies is really happening now and it's a, it's a great opportunity to build an Internet that actually is worthy of the trust that we increasingly place in it today. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. There is no single organization in the world that has the power to force countries to settle conflicts peacefully. There are some organizations that help countries reach agreements without going to war. The most important worldwide organization is the United Nations. A treaty signed in 1945, after World War II, created the United Nations. The purposes of the United Nations, according to its charter, are to maintain international peace and security, develop friendly relations among nations, cooperate in solving international, economic, social, cultural, and humanitarian problems, and promote respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Most nations of the world are members of the United Nations. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. The Trump Administration Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross has glued onto the 2020 census form a question about citizenship. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. Adding that question, as the Trump administration knows, will undermine the validity of the census by suppressing participation by immigrants, which is, after all, the whole point of adding that question at the last minute. Many citizens, non-citizens, lawful permanent residents, and undocumented persons will, of course, not participate in the census because they fear or believe rightly, given the Trump administration antipathy towards immigrants, that answering the census might jeopardize themselves or their families. This is Trumpian voter suppression again. The political effect will be to reduce congressional seats in Democratic-leaning states like California and increase Republican representation in the Congress. All this giving us a front row seat to a raw, politically motivated assault on our Constitution. Again, this time, Section 2 of Article 1, which requires a nationwide census called an enumeration, which means count everyone every 10 years. Fortunately, 12 states are suing the Trump administration over the addition of the citizenship question to the census. In court, hopefully the states, the people, and the values of honesty and integrity and an accurate census will win. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1854. That was the day wealthy populist and labor advocate Jacob Coxey was born. He grew up in Danville, Pennsylvania, and worked as a stationary engineer in an iron mill. 
Soon he moved to Ohio and opened a sand quarry. He entered politics and initially campaigned as a candidate for the Greenback Party. By the 1890s, he had thrown his lot in with the populists. When the panic of 1893 hit, workers flooded the industrial Midwest in search of jobs. Cities across the country were overwhelmed with the newly unemployed begging on the streets. Coxey proposed a good works bill which demanded $500 million for federal jobs. He supported paper currency, public works projects, transportation for rural areas, and full employment. He decided to take his proposal directly to Congress by organizing a protest march on behalf of the unemployed. Hundreds joined him on his march from Ohio to Washington, D.C., forming Coxey's Army. They set off from Massillon, Ohio on Easter Sunday, 1894, supported by populists and organized labor. Estimates of marchers ranged into the tens of thousands. His army, however, was stopped along the way by court injunctions, preventing them from commandeering trains and seizing railway lines as they travel. About 500 eventually reached Washington, D.C. As Coxey climbed the steps of the Capitol to demand the good jobs bill, he and his army were met by police forces, which attacked the crowd and beat them back from the Capitol steps. Years later, his campaigning finally paid off, and he was elected mayor of Massillon. In 1944, he was invited back to the Capitol steps to deliver his good jobs bill, which by that time had become official policy. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor special report recorded on April 19th, 2018. I'm Mark Belanger. One of the ways the labor movement in Africa exerts its influence on policymakers is to advise the continent's various sub-regional economic organizations. Unfortunately, because of the lack of long-term funding and other factors, the advisory organizations established by the labor movement can become ineffectual. But the movement keeps trying to establish its presence at the sub-regional economic bodies as best as possible. One of the success stories is the Organization of Trade Unions of West Africa, known by its acronym OTUWA. A few years ago, the union centrals in West Africa decided that OTUWA should be revitalized in order to represent labor's voice at the Economic Community of West African States, also known as ECOWAS. They chose a veteran labor leader, John Oda, to lead OTUWA. Mr. Oda had been the General Secretary of the Nigerian Labor Congress, one of the most powerful labor centrals in Africa. Nigeria has a population of 350 million. I talked to Mr. Oda and asked him to describe OTUWA, the Organization of Trade Unions of West Africa. The Organization of Trade Unions of West Africa is a sub-regional trade union center of the 15 countries of the Economic Community of West African States. So it's the national centers of all the 15 countries in West Africa. What are the goals of the organization? What does Ottawa do? It seeks to coordinate labor-related activities of the countries in the sub-region, especially in relating with the Economic Community of West African States. ECOWAS, which was established uh, way back in 1975. The, in 2015, what happened was that there was a Congress which uh, held in Abuja after about a decade of non-activity. And this was as a result of the fact that the Secretariat of the organization, which was in Côte d'Ivoire, went into inactivity as a result of the civil war and political instability in the place. Uh, in the protest, the person who was running the secretariat unfortunately died, and um, the activities didn't just uh, continue. So in 2013, 2014, the national centers working with the ILO and the Organization of African Trade Unions and ITUC Africa decided that uh, they should 
revive the subregional organization so that we can take its uh, rightful place in championing the cause of the workers in the subregion. So that was how the conference in Abuja took place. And part of the decision that was taken was to move the headquarters to Abuja, which is also the headquarters of the regional economic community, ECOWAS, and also to appoint a full-time executive secretary to run the organization from Abuja. And this was how I was approached to become the executive secretary of the organization. Prior to this, I had been general secretary of the Nigeria Labor Congress for a period of 12 or so years, and I had been in labor movement for the last 31 or 32 years. In 2015, Otuwa started a five-year plan to revitalize itself. How has that been going? After the revival of the organization, we went through a series of uh, strategic planning, and we came up with a 10 pillars to revive the organization. Part of the pillar was one to strengthen and capacitate the secretariat. Uh, second was to rebuild uh, links, effective links with the ECOWAS and all its uh, departments and activities so that the workers' voice will be ably represented in or whatever that is going on at the level of the ECOWAS. And that's it. International labor news you can use. I'm Mark Belanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. From New York, I'm Luke Vargas with your World in Two Minutes. Wednesday is the last full day on the job for Cuban President Raul Castro, who took over from his brother Fidel in 2006. Cuba's National Assembly is now meeting to choose Raul's successor, but the outcome is almost a foregone conclusion. I would be very, very surprised if the uh, next leader of Cuba is not Miguel Diaz-Canel. That's Marguerite Jimenez, director for Cuba at the Washington office on Latin America. If there were a government in the United States that was looking for an excuse to actively re-engage with Cuba, then this this leadership transition would provide a fantastic opportunity to do that. However, I don't see the Trump administration going that direction. Miguel Diaz-Canal is Cuba's vice president and was groomed by Raul Castro to one day lead the island. The advantage that Diaz-Canal has is that uh, Raul Castro will still be alive. Eduardo Gamara is professor of politics at Florida International University. It's not like he's being elected the next dictator. In fact, the way he's being uh, sold is that he will be first among equals that this is kind of a collegial body that will be ruling Cuba, presided by Diaz-Canel. Unlike in Venezuela, where President Nicolas Maduro was forced to take up the revolutionary mantle upon the sudden death of Hugo Chavez, Diaz-Canel will be able to consult with Raul Castro and other leaders from Cuba's old guard while making consequential decisions about how to steer the country. But decide he must. There's no question that Miguel Diaz-Canel has to address the economy and kind of how the economy performs for Cubans on a daily basis. And just figuring out new ways to expand the private sector, to integrate younger Cubans into the the workforce. Faced with sluggish economic growth, a fragile currency, and dwindling economic aid from longtime benefactor Venezuela, Diaz-Canel will need all the help he can get. Luke Vargas, New York. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Okay, so let's begin with weather from around the world, and we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 38 degrees. What the hell? supposed to be springtime i don't want it this cold don't you know i just planted (laughs) i planted tomatoes and strawberries god i'm gonna have some colorful beautiful 
beautiful heirloom tomatoes coming up, too. Oh, my God. I'll try to take pictures. Okay, 32... Uh, oh, I'm sorry, 38 degrees. That's... I don't know. Put it in the mid-40s, low-50s. I'll handle that, okay? We are going to be warmer today than yesterday. We're going to be in the mid-60s with a steady slide up to uh, the low-70s to mid-70s in the upcoming days. We did have a bit of rain. Uh, spits had some sprinkling uh, yesterday and uh, in the morning when I was doing some planning and just a little bit in the late afternoon when I was uh, doing some other things in the garden. And uh, so we may get a, a spit here and there, but we will be somewhat drying out. We'll see how that works. Uh, pressure is rising at 30.15 inches. Visibility is at 7 miles. Humidity is 94%. I have no data on air quality, but uh, the UV index is high at 7. So I, I mostly always wear a hat now. Yep, that's what I do. Always be prudent. Okay, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people live around the world. London is 84 and sunny. Wow. Paris is 83 and sunny. Oh, spring in Paris. Rome is 76 and sunny. Of course, spring in, in Italy. Rome, oh my God. Kiev is 57 and mostly cloudy. Uh, Kabul is 46 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 70 and partly cloudy. Tokyo is 61 and clear. Sydney, Australia is 65 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 45 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 45 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. Happy spring. And that is... Weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these per personal purchased weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people live around the world. First offering here at the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays is by uh, Nate Raymond out of Reuters. Oh, my. A federal appeals court yesterday blocked an Ohio law that would cut federal taxpayer funding to 28 Planned Parenthood clinics holding that conditions it imposed that denied funds to Abortion providers were unconstitutional. The 6th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Cincinnati upheld a lower court judge's ruling on joining a law Republican Governor John Kasich signed in 2016 that would strip funding that Planned Parenthood received for non-abortion services. Remember, Kasich is not our ally either. Please, please the law would have affected funding for Planned Parenthood programs for mothers and infants' health, HIV counseling and testing, and sex education. Covenant! Planned Parenthood offers abortions in some of its Ohio clinics, but not all of them. Well, I don't know. Some people don't think you should have your tonsils taken out, and sometimes hospitals do take tonsils out. It is a medical procedure. You know, between a patient and their doctor. According to court papers, Planned Parenthood of Great Ohio and Southwest Ohio st said they stood to lose nearly one and a half million in funding annually if the law took effect. Dan Tierney, a spokesman for Republican Ohio Attorney General Mike DeWine. Oh, I remember him, that little weasel who defended the law in court, said his office was reviewing the ruling to determine whether to seek further appellate review. Well, of course, this is a moneymaker. Don't you know? The lawsuit was one of several pursued by Planned Parenthood over access to health care at its center since 2015, 
when anti-abortion activists began releasing videos purporting to show group officials negotiating prices for aborted fetal tissue. Yeah, they were going to sell aborted fetal tissue to a Kenyan Muslim, and then they were going to socialize it and spread that socialized aborted fetal tissue all over the world. And it will rain down upon us huh, from the contrails and the giant B-52s flying high, high, high in the sky. Oh, please. Help us now. Well, of course, Planned Parenthood has called the videos heavily edited and misleading and says at least 13 states that investigated those claims have cleared it of wrongdoing. I should also mention, it's not Planned Parenthood that said that they're heavily edited. It's the court of law. Come on, Reuters. The law at issue in Wednesday's ruling required the Ohio Department of Health to ensure that funding it received through six non-abortion-related federal programs was not used to fund any entity that performs or promotes non-therapeutic abortions. Come on! Ohio argued that Planned Parenthood was seeking a constitutional guarantee to public funding that does not exist. But U.S. Circuit Judge Helen White said the two Planned Parenthood affiliate, affiliates in the case claim no such thing. What they do claim is a right not to be penalized in the administration of government programs based on protected activity outside the programs, she wrote for the three-judge panel. White said the law had violated Planned Parenthood's due process rights by requiring a health care provider surrender its right to provide legal abortions as a condition of participating in programs that have nothing to do with abortion. Well, it's not about abortion. It's not about birth control. It is about making sure women remain chattel. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Okay, finishing up here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is an article out of Share Blue Media by Matthew Chapman. There's more bad news for Ted Cruz. In his effort to hang on to a Senate seat, and a new shocking poll released by Quinnipiac revealed that the Texas race is suddenly neck and neck. Cruz is up by just 47 to 44 percent over his challenger, Democratic El Paso Representative Beto O'Rourke. But to hear from Cruz, he simply does not care what the numbers say. Uh, I recognize that every two to four years, the present Democrats get very excited about turning Texas blue. But that's not going to happen this year. Really? But if Cruz does not want Texas to shift to blue, he'll have to do more than insist that it won't. The poll also showed fewer than half of Texas voters approved of Cruz's job performance or had a favorable opinion of him at 47 and 46 percent, respectively. O'Rourke is currently not well-known with voters, but is 14 points above water among those who do. His discipline strategy of visiting every Texas county and talking to voters in both parties has likely helped him there. Further, Cruz is getting walloped in the fundraising game. O'Rourke famously eschews money from Packs in favor of small donors. Yet he raised a staggering $6.7 million last quarter, more than twice what Cruz has pulled in. Now, let me interject. 
wait till the billionaires start pumping their money in, and then we'll see where we stand. And I should also remind folks, the reason Cruz is so cavalier is the reason the whole GOP is cavalier. They act like they're going to get Russian help again. In spite of what the numbers say, in spite of what the enthusiasm uh, uh, entails, and that, and that enthusiasm is emblematic of something greater and more powerful than what they are, they act like they're going to get Russian help again. And let me remind folks also, is that it was Ted Cruz's campaign who first hired uh, Fusion GPS. And yes, Cambridge Analytica did some work for, for Ted also. Are they still? Uh, for the most part, Cruz has not even tried to pretend he's taking this race seriously. He stooped to attacking or O'Rourke for not using his real first name. A strange play for a man whose actual first name is Raphael. He also seemed unconcerned by how available O'Rourke is making himself to voters. Cruz has opted instead to hold secluded events where private jets can pick him up. Well, let's be clear. Peter O'Rourke is campaigning to his constituency and raising money from his constituency. And so is Ted Cruz. It's just that Ted Cruz's constituency uh, involves each dollar as being a vote. And in his mind, he thinks he has more votes. Well, I guess not, because he's also raising uh, Beto O'Rourke is raising more money than old Ted. But like I like I say, wait until the billionaires start kicking in their money. Behind closed doors, Cruz seems to understand this is not going to be as easy as he makes it sound. At a recent event with donors, he warned that stark raving nut Democrats will crawl all over broken glass in November to vote. As if that's a bad thing. And polling experts now believe that is a possibility. Larry Sabato of the Center for Politics says that he believes Cruz's seat could be in play. And 538's Nate Silver says Cruz is still a favorite but could actually lose. There is no longer a doubt. The GOP will now have to fight for their Senate majority. And a major battlefield of that fight is going to be in Texas. Well, let's make it so. Uh, even though they may still be getting Russian help and uh, brainwashing and uh, uh, brainwashing and data scraping and all of that, uh, you know, they're going to get all that help. It really, truly, only works on the margins. They can only influence a margin. An overwhelming uh, show at the at the voting booth always is a great antiseptic. Cleans it out doesn't it? Okay, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day for West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, but we will be back here tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, uh, because we are all night hawks in the diner of life. And uh, stay tuned uh, to Netroots Radio for the rest of the day, uh, live content for breaking news, and of course uh, I keep saying it, uh, instead of rioting, uh, we we will be broadcasting uh, the resistance <laughs> when when Trump takes that next step in the coup d'état. And uh, until then, uh, we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver.
Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golf clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts T'en mange à d'un d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 